Got him. Perfect. All right. So here's part two last week of uh, Don Yoakum and Mike Bjorkman, myself, talking about how to approach and have a conversation with independent brokerages uh, and how EXP is more fun, more profitable, uh, less liability, you name it. Um, we have the advantage. So sorry to interrupt you. I just wanted to get the recording on for the podcast. So continue there, Don. Yeah, no, that's perfect. And, you know, we were just talking about how these independent brokers, a good example is Gusty in Birmingham, Alabama, where he had a very successful independent broker. I believe they had three offices in their market. And uh, in the one year that he's been with us, uh, he has more than doubled his market share. Now, uh, converting a independent to the XP platform, the way that I articulate that is I really say, I, I will, when I open up a conversation with an independent broker, I'll ask them, first of all, acknowledge them for their success and the great reputation that they've established in the community. And would they like to use that as a foundation to then scale their business regionally and even nationally and ultimately internationally? Is that something they ever have given thought to? And uh, they'll say, well, I don't know, you know, and, and because they don't really, it's just not possible for them, right? In their current situation and say and so then i would share with them well there there have been a lot of folks that have created a nice presence in their marketplace like you that have gone on to do that and have taken their 40 agents to over 600 for example i think of mitch reback in uh, daytona beach florida for example and so then though, you've got to help them understand the logistics. I would tell you guys, if there's one sentence to articulate to an independent broker, it is that they could scale their business without broker liability and capital risk. How, what do you think about that one, Mike? Well, I love that. I wanna, I wanna role play that in a second, but I'm just about ready to go live in our group. And there, that should be it. Go live anyways. Let me go back to you. All right. Yeah. So, so I love that. And and when you talk to when you talk to an independent brokerage or broker, one of the, I mean, there's so many different things, right? So, God dang it. Um, sorry, almost there, almost there. Uh, I like to start talking about how now they can compete with some of the big boys that actually have, um, you know, the training, the software, the marketing, things like that. Because when I talk to a independent brokerage or broker, I talk about also, I say, listen, why are you an independent broker? And they go, well, I feel like I can do things that the other brokers can't do. And I, and I can save the money from a, from a franchise and I could reinvest that into my uh, organization. I feel like with my hand holding, that's why these people are really doing good and blah, blah, blah. So mm -hmm. I know that's all be true, right? So I'll start to say things like, you know, let me ask you a question, you know, how many agents do you have? And let's be honest, the average independent might have anywhere from 10 to 50 agents for the most part, unless it's a really, you know, old school, really well-known place in the community. Sure. And since I had a brokerage of 300 people and I still ran it like an independent brokerage, right? We barely used any of the franchise tools any barely the franchise technology. And I would say, I'm, I'm tr really trying to explode with these 10 people out of the 300 or 20 people. And that's similar to an independent brokerage, right? And mm -hmm. I said, I had so much stress on my hands because I was actually trying to run a company, deal with the paperwork, deal with the liability, deal with all this stuff. But my own team's production was suffering because I was working with these other people. So one of the ways I talk to an independent brokerage is I talk about how we take a lot of pressure and weight off their shoulders, right? Absolutely. We could just start 
in the paperwork and liability section, right? You know, how many hours a week, Don, would you say you spent on logistics and paperwork and employees? And, you know, how many hours a week would you say you spent on uh, meeting one-on-one -on -one individually, training these agents? Um, how, how, how long do you think you'd spend a week actually sitting down and working on your own skill set so you knew what to train, you know? Uh, how many hours a week do you spend on just normal junk running, you know, a company? So I would take all those things and say, now with EXP, we have seven to 10 classes a day taught by some of the top agents and teams in the nation, highly vetted, proven their mastery in their course. You know, now you can meet with these people once a week, divvy up the classes, meet back again and talk about the classes. Um, you know, all the recorded stuff. So education is a huge thing for an independent broker. And unfortunately, what, what I found out is the independent broker, they, they think they know a lot. Let's put it that way. They think they do. Sure. They really don't. Most independent brokers that I talk to haven't even been through the recession. <laughs> like, wow. You know, and they think they know everything. They think they can talk about everything. They, they just don't have the skill set that they think they do. So I try to really politely help them understand that. And I try to politely help them understand how much money they spend on day-to-day -day operations that they could get rid of. Uh, I know when I ran my office, I had to have a full-time office manager. And most of those guys do anyways. It's usually their assistant or their transaction coordinator with wearing two hats. But the reality is, is they got to spend a lot of time on that stuff. They got to spend a lot of money on that stuff. And we starting, and then we start breaking down the profitability, you know, at my best at 300 agents, I was making $4,500 a year per agent. Mm -hmm. Best. Right. So if way, all that's I pretty did, darn good, I know, <laughs> and I ran a profitable shop, you know, and and I, I was training them to be profitable. You know, there were a sales machine, you know, there, it was just a big sales machine. So, but what I talk about was, so let me get this straight. So if, if, if my top profitability number was $4,500 a year per agent, let's, let's try to break that down, right? So as an independent brokerage, that even if you average that out, there's really the top 10 or 20% that's making that number average that high. Otherwise, if you took these four or five people out, that number would be less than 2,000. So at our company, as a capping agent, $2,800 you're going to get in their revenue share, which is more profit than you would get <laughs> at a normal brokerage. And you wouldn't have to worry so much and lose sleep at night about these three or four agents that you know darn well, once they get good, they take off. So you're consistently, consistently trying to bring these people back. Let me reinforce your point that you just made. Yeah. You just gave me a great aha. So the, you know, between us guys, and I'm kind of role playing with you here, between us guys, would you agree that the profit per agent is in the neighborhood of $3,000 per agent per year? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. And, and I know you've got 40 agents, so, you know, $120,000. And I presume you're a producing broker as well. Yeah, yeah. Without that, without that, you know, I probably couldn't run the shop. Fair enough. And and by the way, don't feel bad. That that's the way it is for most independent brokers of your size. The fact that you're operating with a profit is actually better than some. One of the things that a lot of independent brokers are uh, why they're taking such a hard look at EXP is because you can earn $2,800 per agent per year in revenue share without broker liability and capital risk. So you're, you're still going to be wanting to uh, lead your team responsible to them, but you're no longer responsible for them, nor are you accepting their liability. And so what this does is have you earn an equivalent amount of profit. And I think we'd both agree if you strip your production out of your model, that profit per agent might even fall below $2,800. And that really serves, Mike, is just the foundation. One of the things that we're seeing, and we have seen in a number of cases, is that when an individual has built 
their foundation, I'm talking about the people they've directly attracted to the company, to 25. Three years from that day, the organization will organically grow to approximately 500 agents. Okay, so what I'm trying to say to you is you're literally sitting on a gold mine. If we take just 25 of the 40 agents in your existing brokerage, and I, I'm guessing you've got a few that aren't worth bringing with you, right? We all did it as brokerages. So let's just assume that 25 come with you. What, what our experience is, is that one or two of those 25 are going to be what we call business builders. They're literally going to want to build a company of agents, an organization of agents underneath you. Now, mind you, we're going to help them do that. You're going to help them. I'm going to help them. Our whole team. In fact, they're going to have seven people with a vested interest in doing that. And because of that, it'll build out to these, um, this 500. Now, Truth be told, just like any brokerage, not everybody caps. Capping, by the way, only requires 80,000 gross commission income in a year. What you're going to find in the real numbers, if you pull behind, look behind the screen, is that we'll earn about $812 per agent per year. So do the math on that. You get yourself to 500 agents, you make $800, it's 400,000. You know, if we, if we round that down mightily, how nice would it be if three years from today, you were sitting on a quarter million dollars in recurring income? That's, that's what's possible for you. Yeah. The, the thing that I love to point out as well is when I talk to them, I say, here, here you're in a small geographical area as well, right? All of us know people all around the country, right? When I owned my brokerage, I didn't, I had to I had to work with people sometimes that I didn't necessarily want to work with because I had to beg and plead that maybe they'll sell a house so I can get that little chunk of their commission. They'll all add up and pay the bills. But now I get to work with amazing people from all over the country. And very few of those people are in my town because let's, let's accept the fact that geographically, there's only a few good agents in every good, in every town, wouldn't you agree? So, there's so many, and I mean so many benefits to having people across the country. That web spreads much faster. You deal with people that you want to deal with, and you don't have to, you know, chase people around and necessarily worry about attrition as much as you would uh, when you go across the country. Not only that, in LA, where I live, at any minute we're waiting for an earthquake to destroy Southern California. When my paycheck depends on local sales, it's not healthy, right? So if there's a massive earthquake in Los Angeles and half of my team is across the country, that revenue that I normally would depend on geographically locally, I don't have to depend on that anymore. That's and right. if mission compression is, is really put on full bore in, in Los Angeles, Miami, New York, the Midwest states and the Southern states, there's still six and 7% commissions and nobody's even trying to cut their commission yet. The whole thing is, is amazingly protected for diversification. You know, even my property management company, it's diversified pretty well, but it's still geographically local. And if that earthquake does take this out, take us out, I've lost both of my businesses. This way, I'm still paying my bills. And the benefits go on and on and on from there. Noel just joined us. Noel came from a um, independent brokerage, and I was very lucky enough to sponsor her. And she had an amazing <laughs> brokerage, um, an amazing team of people, and very influential, you know, everywhere in the country. And and Noel and I would have talks like this um, pretty much daily or every other day. And it was a it was a and. It was a really interesting process to see like everything that we told her up front the day we met her it was nice to see it unfold not not unfortunately for her but fortunately for our relationship because you know one day it would be another one of my good agents is leaving now i got another lawsuit like all the things we talked about actually came true <laughs> <laughs> so, I anybody leave i was worried about people leaving but, and yeah, it was my constant fear yeah. 
It was the constant fear that the top producers were going to leave. The lawsuit thing, however, is very, very real. And um, my husband and I are both attorneys, and we also just didn't want that liability um, after we had been in it about six months. We realized it's a really very real thing that's totally out of your control. So I was happy to let go of that, finally. But it did take, Mike, about five months of conversation before I really was ready to make the switch. Mm -hmm. And it was kind of nice. And, and I recommend on a side note that all you guys that are working on attraction, obviously, if you're on here, you are go after the good size independent brokerages, because it's literally practice every single day for normal attraction, but it just keeps you in the game at all times. So when I was talking to Noel, I, at, right at the tip of my tongue and the front of my brain was all the reasons why an independent brokerage should not be, you know, let's be honest. Now that I'm at the company two years and I haven't had a brokerage in a long time, I remember the pain points, but I don't remember the real feeling of it. But every day when I got to talk to Noel, I really got, it was in my heart. Like, Oh, I was right there with her. So I was able to talk to uh -huh. her. You know what I mean? I could really feel yeah. the pain. So, um, and, and there's, and what we really should do at some point and, maybe I can talk somebody into taking better notes at one point is really write down, here's the top 40 benefits of being at eXp versus a, a independent broker. So you can actually go down the list because right now this is great role playing and we're, we're pulling it from here and there and there and go, Oh wait, you just made me think of something. Oh wait, you just made me think of something, you know, and uh, it's go from there. The other really interesting thing that I never thought about, about an independent brokerage was these brokers have, I mean, there's 50 states and I'm in LA, right? So the nearest border to me is five hours away and it's Arizona. That's it. That's the only border we have or Nevada, I should say. So, but these independent brokerages, they're all over these states where there's borders. And surprisingly enough, a really big complaint is I have to have a license in three different states. I have to have MLSs in like three or four different areas and at EXP, you wouldn't have to do that anymore. You could still run your team and recruit agents to work in your organization, but you don't have this massive budget. It was like, it was like some of the people I'm talking to are three or $4,000 a month just to be part of these MLSs. And they're like, like licensed in four different states just so they could have one top producer be at their office. And I'm just going, thank God I never had that. I mean, I had the MLS issue, but I never had that. Like, that was another real big thing too that you don't hear a lot about. So I wanted to point that out. Um, yeah, that was, a, that, was, that was a big thing for me when you were talking to me. That was a huge part of the reason why I started looking around because I had um, a big producer that came to me and said, hey, if you don't go get your license in Florida, I'm probably going to leave you because we, we're going to open up another office in Florida and I want to do that. And I couldn't even physically get my broker's license in Florida yet. I hadn't been licensed in Minnesota long enough to go just get my broker's license there. And so I was really up against a creek for this producer that was a fairly large producer at my brokerage. Um, and then the other, the other piece of that is just trying to um, keep those agents happy if they can't, if they can't, they're going to leave. They're going to leave. If, they, if you can't get a second license somewhere else, like in, I'm in Minnesota and we have a lot of people that have dual licenses here. So I've just I'm in Minnesota. No, -uh, you're really there. So, but what's interesting, and there's a success story. Noel converted her brokerage, Bright Birch Real Estate, into EXP. That producer came with her, and I did see this morning that producer selling homes in Florida. So everything yeah. worked out perfectly. So the other thing you said that has to be spoke about is a lot of these brokers again never have been through a recession. They don't understand what that even looks like, right? So the very first thing when a market turns is your average agent that doesn't work hard and relies solely on referrals and doesn't have a real big skill set, they they fall out of the business. They go back and get a real job. And then the other agents, if the market goes down, you know, say 10, 20, 30%, you got to think about it, their paychecks go down 10, 20, 30%. So your split, unless you're a flat fee, goes down 10, 30, 40%. But what's even weirder is 
the amount of sales. So right now our town is cranking away at 150 sales a day, but when the market shifts, now you're down to 50 sales a day or 70 sales a day. So when the recession hit me, effectively I had a 75% pay cut. The sale prices went down 50% during the recession and the amount of sales went down 50%. That's a huge pay cut. So as the broker, and, and I'll tell a story right after this, as a broker, you take the same pay cut as the agents. So right now you're cruising, you're profitable, you're doing okay, but the reality is, when a market does shift, you are definitely going to, you know, feel that 50 to 75% pay cut. And imagine today, if you had a 50 or 70% pay cut, would your business be profitable? And the answer is always no, because it's just simple math, right? And the leases don't go down in price. You're stuck in a lease. You don't get to control that. You don't get to control electricity. You don't get to control a lot of these things. But here's the kicker, and, and, and this was very real. When I saw slight market shifts in 2018, when we had a very slight market shift, and I was like, whoa, that was real. That was a real bump. Like I started, we started teaching how to survive in a shifting market. You guys probably remember that. That was a thing for like six months. Oh crap, the market's crashing. But what happens is the agents get more demanding. Mike, if we're gonna make it through this recession, we need a bigger office. We need a better office. We need better software. We need this. We need that. We need all this stuff to survive the market. So you, you as an independent broker go, wait a minute. I was already breaking even before. Now the market crashes. I can't pay my bills. And now you want more, right? So that is powerful for a broker. And it's hard when they don't understand if they don't know what they don't know and they've never been through that. But that is the most real thing that I've ever seen talked about or heard with an independent broker. Don, you went through some recessions. Tell, oh, me, yeah. what that, tell me what that looked like as a principal owner of a Keller Williams office. Like I, I can only imagine, but I want to hear it out of your mouth. Like what, what did sure, that look sure. like? Well, Keller Williams is a very high volume, low margin model. And so my very large offices actually did fare reasonably well in spite of that, obviously the profit went down rather dramatically. Uh, the kind of the tipping point <laughs> in that model is about 200 agents. If you're if you're above 200 agents, uh, now this was some years ago, by the way. To your point a moment ago, we've had some forces on the marketplace that I wasn't dealing with in uh, those years, which is we've had commission compression, and we've also had agent to broker comp margin compression, right. okay? The only thing that's keeping these folks in play is the fact that we've had an outstanding market for the last eight years, okay? So what happens is, is and what happened um, with that environment was when uh, these offices that were nominally profitable, again, the big ones were pretty profitable, but let's say they, um, I had a 125 to 150 agent office. It would be nominally profitable. A 25% correction in volume would, would vaporize all the profit. Okay. And so it's interesting though, because when I first, because I've been in eXp now for two years as well. And when I first got in, there was all this talk about, well, you know, I don't know if eXp is sustainable, right? And I'm, I'm, I'm going, well, they have no long-term debt. They're adding $2 million a month to their balance sheet. They've got no class A commercial leases. Of course, I had those, right? And, uh, but now when we look back, right, I joined, they had 10,600 agents. Today they have 32,000 agents, okay? If tomorrow we lost 50% of our agents and went back to 16,000, okay? That would be 5,400 agents more than when we were adding $2 million a month to our balance sheet. Okay, now to be fair, EXP had 352 employees when I joined. I think that last I heard they had something like 650. They'd have to right size their staff to clean that up, but they can do that in 90 days, right? right? That was not an option for me um, I was very, very fortunate to be able to navigate 
you know, commercial landlords, those guys are, they're not, you know, they're not coming from the heart, baby. They're coming from the pocketbook. And if it makes business sense to them, they'll cooperate. Otherwise, no deal. And to your point, you know, when, when the market does shift, you know, you might be thinking to yourself today, oh, well, I'll just sublease my property. That might actually, with COVID, that might actually be a little tricky, but normally you could just do that, right? Well, when the market shifts, you can't sublease the property for an amount that covers your nut uh -huh. okay, in nine out of 10 cases. And so you're sitting there going, geez, you know, do I, do I sustain this, whatever, twelve, fifteen thousand $15,000 a month loss? Uh, or do I close the office and have a $12,000 lease payment liability? And so you're kind of like, well, I might as well just kind of fight through this. And so it extinguishes a lot of wealth in that regard. And, you know, you made a, another point. So I hope I answered your question is it's terrible. Okay. If you have a, if you have a tip, a typical bricks and mortar enterprise, and you sustain a significant loss of revenue, you're going to go from nominally profitable to break even and maybe losing money, paying for the privilege of running that business. Mm -hmm. right? Even in a good market, I was writing checks. Occasionally, yeah, and, and some are. I mean, the truth be told, I don't know what the percentage is, but a large percentage is of the independent brokers under 40 agents, if they took their own personal production out of the PL, they would not be running a profitable enterprise, right? Mm -hmm. So we, um, we have such a unique situation for them. And I, you know, I try to reach them and I say, hey, now is the time to make that transition in a healthy market. You don't want to be navigating that transition in the middle of a crash, right? Come right, because they're, you know, the market's been raging why don't you navigate this transition coming from a position of strength, right? And what you have done is significant, but really what you could think about is that's the foundation for what will be a regional, national, and even international company. Have you, do you know, by the way, Mike, how many agent, how many states are you in now? 42, I think. Okay, so think about that. Um, you know, when I, I talk to, when I'm talking about market cycles, which normally it cycles about every seven years, I say, well, normally what, what, what'll happen is it'll correct in Southern California, then Northern California, then the Northwest, then Idaho, then Arizona, and it kind of, it circles around, right? And, and they agree with that, which is typically how it does occur, right? I go, well, what's nice is I've got agents in all of those states. So with the market cycles, okay, maybe I'm not doing as well in so Southern Cal, but now I'm doing well in Northern California or the Northwest, right? When you have 42 states, think about the strength of that diversification in terms of your revenue strength, right? And you don't have 42 commercial leases, right? You just got agents in those states and uh, it's all profit. Anyway, it, uh, I just, <clears throat> I, I can tell you, and you know, we had a little bit of a discussion about whether the market's going to correct or not. And I personally, I think we're overdue for a correction, but because interest rates are so low, it's driving crazy volume right now. The, the, the thing I have is peace of mind, okay? If I owned 30 brokerages or I had a principal interest, I had built 10, right? But I actually had a principal interest in 30 bricks and mortar enterprises, I'd be absolutely terrified right now. <laughs> no doubt. <laughs> right? Right. Well, the, you bring up another really good point. And Noel, I want you to help me on this one too. So you live in this small geographical area. Let's, let's pretend we're in Noel right now. And you're in Minneapolis, right? And her brokerage starts growing. And now to attract agents 20 miles away, they want another physical location over there, right? So let's say Noel's brokerage was profitable in 2019 by, let's give her tons of money and say it was profitable by 150,000 without her own production. Okay. Is that realistic? That would be, that would be a really good operation. I know. I'm okay, giving her the benefit of the doubt. Which I had, I will say I had awesome. that. I was profitable. 
Okay, so let's That's say awesome. let's say one hundred fifty thousand dollars for two thousand and eighteen was a realistic number. That was a great brokerage, great broker, all this stuff. And now two thousand and twenty one is approaching us, and Noel goes, you know what? In order to expand properly, we need to open another location. Noel, you had a beautiful office. It wasn't that big, but I know there was a lot of money put into it. Do you have any idea how much TI and money you put into opening that office? Do you remember about? Yeah, um, my monthly overhead was between four and five grand a month. But so with TI and decorations and furniture and all that, do you remember that? <laughs> Yeah, probably around 70 to 80,000 okay. so that I put into it. Yeah, so effectively half of 2018's overhead is gone, right? So you have to start over, but you're going to be, you're probably going to be bigger than 12, 1300 square feet because you're going to want to kind of impress the new area. So you just took basically all your profit, you know, your first, your last, your this and that, and all the TI, took all your profit from 2018 got into another location and i've never talked to an independent broker that says oh no i'm fine here i never plan on expanding unless they were just you know a hundred years old and gonna retire and die right there in this little office and they own the building anyways they don't own anything on it but most hustlers say i'm gonna open another location in the next three years and we're gonna expand right so good so now you took all that profit one hundred fifty thousand dollars, drop it into this new place it's going to take another two years to make that profitable and for sure by that time, you're going to have a correction in the market. I mean, there's no way. It's just inevitable, right? So now you're, you're, you're planning your, your hard work for the last three years, getting up and running and profitable, and now you wasted all that profit again, and now it's going to be gone. Like Those are the real things that I've seen in the market. I've actually witnessed it and seen it, and I've watched people. I'll give you a good example. When I found my home smart office in Northridge, it was a real estate office from 2000 and, uh, 1995, and it was one of the top offices in all of Southern California in our area, all the way up until the recession in 2009. They were booming, right? And it was about 4,500 square feet. It was a nice big office and a nice, very nice commercial strip, but it was vacant from that point all the way until Mike came around and found this office that was just happened to be set up for a real estate office. Would the things that I found in there from 2008 up until 2000 and what year was that, that I got that? I was, I don't know, let's say 2013. That was a long time. Like there was fax machines left behind in that office. I mean, so they could not rent that office out that entire time. No real estate companies were growing or expanding. They were all folding and going under. So to walk into that office and hear the stories from the neighbors and the agents that I eventually hired, they're like, yeah, that was the, that was the place to work. That was the office. And it was crickets that whole time because nobody else wanted it. And I put $100,000 of my own cash into that when I leased that place out, right? I mean, it's insane to think about. And Mike, I want to just point out when agents come to me, when they address this issue of, well, yeah, but you guys don't have an office. Mike, what I say to them is I say that what EXP has done is they have um, built a cloud-based brokerage and they have stripped out of the model the costs that do not add value to the consumer, right? And mm -hmm. so I just ask them, I go, you know, what, what does an office have to do with getting a listing sold? Mm -hmm. Absolutely nothing, right? Right. And so and they can keep their that, office if they want. That's the beautiful part of it. Well, they can. And by the way, you know, um, you guys, some of them are going to be in leases. But I think that the, what we try, when we bring over, and I've brought over a few, when we bring over independence, we ultimately want to get their net cost to zero. One of the things that you can do to coach them on that, by the way, is they may be in a community where, let's say that they have um, 30 agents in their office. And would you agree, Mike, when you have an office of 30 agents, uh, at any one time, you're lucky if six to eight of them are actually in the office? Very lucky. Okay, unless you're having a team meeting that day or something. Right. Okay, so one of the things that you can do is you might have 
500 EXP agents in that community. And so what you do is you go to the, uh, the owner and say, well, here's what you can do. Uh, our suggestion is you allow your existing agents to just continue occupying the space as you have, but we could put the word out to the other 500 EXP agents that you would make your space available for them to meet clients, conference room, such, uh, use the printer scanner, et cetera, you know, for 7,500 bucks a month. Well, you know, like Noelle had an office where she was running a four to $5,000 nut. If we got her 40 agents from that area that wanted to have access to that, it could eliminate that cost. So that's one way that you can help them. And this is important because you, you, um, when they come over into the EXP model, um, they're gonna, of course, be sharing revenue with EXP, right? And so you wanna make sure that those costs that are not adding value to the consumer are get eliminated. And so that's one way to do it. Yeah, absolutely. Hey, Craig, Chastain, I know you're in the middle of something, but- Yes, sir. When I was describing expansion for the average independent broker, like yourself, was I pretty much right on the money? Was that kind of your future if looking forward? It was, it was a little bit further in the future, but yeah. Are you glad? I, 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 I think, I think, I mean, I think you have to expand to exist, you yeah. know, if it, to, to, to maintain profitability. Is all this stuff that we're talking about right now, what went through your head also, is this what that myself and Jesse and everybody were talking about that it finally clicked and made sense to you too? Is this, is this like no, it's real. I mean, I kind of saw the writing on the wall before we were talking. Um, you know, I was always a hustler trying to make trying to make things work. And I mean, profitability is a huge, huge component with the brokerage. And um, yeah, you're, 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 I mean, you're picking up little small crumbs along the way. And like you said, one little thing falls out. And you're you're going in the going in the red. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's nice about once you get up and running. Um, you, you always worry about your own personal production, but after a couple of years, if you, if you work and, and meet enough nice people that want to come be part of your organization, your production doesn't matter as much anymore because your revenue share. We just recruited an independent brokerage somewhere back east with, I think, 30 or 40 agents, and, and we were having the battle, which we should have, hopefully we have time to do that, about my team is not going to want to pay that split, right? They're not going to want to go from that brokerage to an 80-20, whether it's their own, because almost all independent owners have their own team too. So that's actually two different conversations. But I actually had to get a calculator out with, and I, you guys know me, I'm the worst numbers guy in the world. And I don't know how I was on this call, but I got my calculator out and showed this independent broker how he was actually going to make more money in revenue share from his team than he would um, on the split. And he was so worried about them paying the split. So it was like mind blowing. He's like, wait a minute. I'm making the same amount in revenue share as I was on their taking their little splits. Like, you know, they're, they're in a low, no low price range. I think it was like 150, 75,000. And when we did the calculations, like, wow, you know, and um, it was really amazing to show that. And I was, it was an aha moment for me too, because I was able to go, wow, Mr. Calculator, you just proved in three minutes how owning or not owning an independent brokerage is more profitable. And that was, that was pretty exciting for me because I'd never actually did the numbers before. I always went bigger numbers and bigger price ranges and more agents, but just a 35, 40 office was more profitable at eXp. And some of the things that we could, could let go and the production um, of the team leader or the brokerage owner, I should say, if they still want to stay in production, which they, usually have to they don't have a choice now you can describe to them what if you didn't have to do all that day-to-day -day stuff and you really focused on your team and the people that matter to you do you think their production might double or triple do you think you'd sell more houses do you think you personally without all that stress could focus a little bit more on some of your relationships that pay you i mean there's so many advantages and they're all so real and and i love going through this because it's like, do you guys feel like some of you guys on me, do you feel like you can now after the last couple of weeks go to a independent brokerage and make sense to them? Like, 
that's it's a real big thing when you finally see that and go man because sometimes agents don't realize what broker owners go through <laughs> you know, so it's real what else you got noel Anything i think two yeah there's a couple other pieces um three three things one there's a pride element for brokers and i had major major pride around the brand that i had created and this business that was mine it was all mine i had created it and i was so proud of that and i felt like had i left that and gone to exp this was my thought in the beginning that i was acknowledging failure and that I, my brokerage had failed and instead i had to get over that and get past that pride element and realize that this was a decision that i was making because i actually truly cared about the agents that were with me and that i as a little broker could never ever ever provide them the same opportunity the same $35 per share stock opportunity that no other brokerage could provide. I mean, honestly, I'm looking at my, my app today and I am in a state of shock over the stock because I just didn't even really care about it initially when we were making the move. But I knew that I had agents that were going to care about it. And, and sure enough, I ended up going through this, and this is a lot with a lot of big teams too, you'll go through this same thing because there's a lot of big teams that are thinking about splitting off and starting their own brokerage and they've got pride around the big team situation. Um, but there, there's a lot of big teams or independent brokers that aren't ever going to be able to offer their agents the same thing that you can offer them with eXp. It's just not even possible. And so a lot of these bigger um, teams though, or for me, I did the same thing. I was so concerned about going to my agents and telling them that I was going to make this switch and that they were going to have to come with me. And I just got in my head that they were all going to be really mad that I was doing this. And instead, what ended up happening is we had 100% of the people came with us, all of them, every single person trusted me to make that decision and come with. And now so many of them have capitalized on the opportunity that's within eXp and they're making way more way more than I could have ever paid them as a big team lead or a, a little broker. And then the other piece is once I made that move and I made the decision, people came out of the woodwork because I was a known name in our area. People appeared out of the woodwork saying, what on earth did you just do? And I want to talk to you about it. And they would have never joined me as a little broker. They, you know, like Karen with Property Geeks who came with 14 agents. She never would have joined me as a little brokerage. And you know what? I probably couldn't have handled her group and her volume. And so it's just been amazing to watch how it actually worked. And um, I mean, it is life changing. I'm so thankful that Mike <laughs> was very persistent. <laughs> the best video you ever did. Would not let me say no. <laughs> <laughs> the best video you ever did, Noel, is when you were doing why we made the move. And you just said, and, and I could see it in your eyes, I just could never compete. I just couldn't. And if I care about my mm -hmm. agents, I can't do that. So that's another thing I talk about with the independent brokerages. I say, listen, you seem like you care a lot about your agents. You do, right? Yeah. Then why would you hold a retirement plan from them? Why would you hold diversification from them? Why would you, why would you take training away from them? Why would you take a better compensation model? Right? If you truly care, not only is it financially irresponsible for yourself, but now you're screwing your entire brokerage. How do you feel about that? Like, are you, what, what inside of you is so selfish that you're going to take all these wonderful things away from an agent? Like, man, that's a big deal, right? That's a really big deal. I know, I know my team leader this morning, he, he started our office meeting off today. He goes, I'm going to start this off today by showing you what I did. I've paid $26,000 in stock over my agent equity program. And now I have $100,000 in the bank. And I've only been at this company, you know, whatever, wherever we've been. And that was like, that hit me. I'm like, I did that. I got him a hundred grand for his retirement. Because without me moving to EXP, he never would have. We'd still be at HomeSmart or wherever the heck I would have gone to. Like, dude's got 100 grand in the bank, right? And I'm pretty excited to have almost 500 grand in the bank. That's, I never had that at KW, right? Never had that at HomeSmart. I spent that at HomeSmart. So there's, there's, there's a really powerful thing to say when you say, why would you want to hold all that away from your team? What inside of you makes your team not want to succeed? 
Like, what is, are you crazy? Like, of course you wouldn't use those words, right? But that's the feeling that you got to transfer to them because it is true. They just don't see it yet. So you can't be mean about it, you know? Like I'll well, do in the, in the, <laughs> the, the The other piece of that is any team leader or broker knows that a lot of people that are successful only have, you know, a shelf life of two to five years, right? Five is a lot for somebody to stick with a, a team or a brokerage. But if they're really good, they have a shelf life. They're going to leave within two years. And so lately, a big part of my conversations has been about relationships and that this is also the only model that will maintain all of the relationships that you have ever built within real estate. Those people, they decide to leave you because they're successful. They're not leaving you anymore. Now they're staying with you. They're staying with you. They're staying underneath you and they're continuing to add value to everything that you've you provide them now, it's going to pay you back just in the form of rev share. And it's the only model that will maintain relationships like that. Yeah, that was, that was another big part of it, right? Like if you, and this is, and this is what I, 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 if you watch my bootcamp video, it talks a lot about set them up for success. You know, we can't feed all this into them and then not have it work. So, you know, you got to be upfront and I'll say you got to have the agents trained. You have to have them plug in and you have to have them really experience the exposure of what you want, what you're going to have. Meaning you have to teach them about revenue share and attraction and, and really use the meetings in the world and, and have them know the same love for the company as you. And then once you get, you know, then building an empire book will show us and Jay Kinder's video is amazing at this, how you support that team. And they will never leave once they have a few grand a month in revenue share. It's the ones that are on the island that don't. And the ones that are on the island are the ones that are going to leave to go to Cobalt Banker or whoever's writing the big checks this month, Compass or whatever. So it is, it is a real thing. Like, look, you still get to have your family. You still get to support them. You still, you still, you still. And they will, you will always be financially aligned with those people. And that's really interesting. That's really powerful. Like, like there's so many people in my organization just after two years that I never thought I would talk to ever again if they ever left my team and we're still super good friends and super, you know, we're family. It's like, it's an amazing, it's an amazing experience to go through. And I think, again, that's why the third party validation calls are so important, the three-way Zooms. So you can have an independent broker get on and talk about the success and, uh, and be upfront about some of the failures too. Like I've had failure. I've learned a lot from it. I can't wait to do my next bootcamp video. <laughs> so say, here's, here's what I've learned since last May when I did that other one, right? <laughs> and talk about those things, but I don't know. We got a few minutes left. Do you guys have any questions or any other thoughts um, that we haven't covered or any aha moments or anything you've had during this call? While we're waiting for a question, Mike, I'll just say what Noelle shared there about being able to enable her agents to have the same opportunity that she has, I think is really material. You know, I was talking to an independent broker the other day and he was kind of ragging on the recruiting of eXp and uh, the revenue share basically. And I says, well, Patrick, you do recognize you, you have a revenue share model as well, right? I mean, aren't you sharing in the revenue of your agents? And he says, well, yeah, you know, I mean, they have an 80, 20 split, right? He's like, yeah. And I says, the only difference here is you're just giving them the same opportunity you have. It's just that you and them won't have the broker liability and capital risk. Right. And I think that is because the independence, you know, these are a lot of really nice family owned boutique type brokerages. They really care about their people. And it's important that they understand what Mike was saying too a moment ago is that <clears throat> by not choosing to align with us, they're actually preventing them from having, in some cases, a cap for sure stock revenue share and the support and collaboration. There is nothing in this industry that has this level of support and collaboration. And I've been at the best, right? I mean, it is, I thought we had great culture at KW. In fact, we did. Okay. But we didn't have this level of support and collaboration. Would you say, Mike? I mean, <laughs> no way in the world. 
No. And, and it's, it's such a powerful thing that it's actually hard to explain. Like when you're on a recruiting call and you're talking, oh, you're going to have so much support and collaboration and, and, and you just listen to yourself, you go, I would not believe myself. Like, I wouldn't. It's, and that's why those calls, again, are so important to get other people on. It really is. Like, my gosh, um, I had such a good thought and it just flew out of my mind. Um, oh, you know, the, the nice thing to talk about when they do own the independent brokerage and, and they're talking about, um, like you said, aren't you, aren't you doing revenue share with your agents, right? And they say, well, recruiting is not really my thing. Well, if you're going to own an independent brokerage, and I always ask them this, I said, well, look, if you could double your good agents, would your business be more successful? And they say, yeah. And I said, well, as an independent recruiter, as an independent brokerage, your job is to truly recruit. Because if you lose three or four agents and they all go start another brokerage somewhere or join another big team, effectively, that's going to chop your business. So if you're not always forward thinking and replacing that, how in the world are you ever going to do that? And they understand they've been bitten a few times and they get it. So I go, stop saying that you're not in a recruiting game because any good team, teamerage or brokerage, that's all you do is recruit. That's it. That is, that is how you stay and remain successful. Like, like Jonathan's on my team on this right now. He knows I love my team and they're good producers, but I'm always looking for more. I'm always looking for, for good, successful agents. And honestly, it has nothing to do with the XP. I mean, it does to a certain extent, but for the most part, I'm looking to build my team, my actual profitable team. So EXP is just a wonderful benefit of revenue share and then, you know, being financially aligned forever, all that stuff. But I'm truly Team Bjorkman needs to grow because we always gain one, lose one, gain one, lose one, gain one, lose one. And I'd rather gain three and lose one and gain three and lose one, you know, and continue to grow the team. My dream is to have, you know, 40 frontline agents on my team at all times. That's what I'm going to work up to, right? So I'm always fine with my levels, but I'm always profitable and running that amount of people is the typical size of an independent brokerage anyways, but I just cut out all the BS, right? So it's like, it's like heaven all wrapped up in a, in a bow. <laughs> you know? yeah, absolutely. So. Yeah. And, you, and you're closing in on a thousand agents, right? I mean, aren't you? Yeah, I will hit a thousand probably by the end of next month. Dude, that's so awesome. Yeah, we're, That just we're, goes to show you what's, what's possible with this model. It took me five years to get to 300 agents it took me two years to get to a thousand well mike five years to get to 300 that's like stratospheric 90 percent of the brokers take five years to get to 30 agents <laughs> yeah so, that's crazy and the thing that <clears throat> and you will get that you guys just kind of as a closing thought they're going to say well i don't really like to recruit and as mike said well you know, they did have to recruit the 30, but the difference is such a big difference is that they had to take those recruits from goal to goal by themselves and produce and manage the brokerage. In our environment, they have seven people with a vested interest in their success. So <clears throat> we work as a team. Their goal is going to be to just make an appointment with Mike or someone else on the team, Jesse, whatever, right? And here. you guys are going to help close them. As a matter of fact, in the beginning, they know just enough to be dangerous. So we don't actually want them closing, right? Exactly. What we want is they have established themselves in their communities, a level of respect and credibility. What we're now going to enable them to do is leverage that. They have not, like Noelle said, there were people that, reached out to her once she joined the eXp platform that she could have never attracted to her boutique brokerage or, or even handled that, that team of 14, right? And so the eXp platform enabled her to get in business that people liked and respected her, but she didn't have the infrastructure to support. And that's pretty exciting. It really is. And, and we're right up on it. But I have one more thought for everybody that's going to listen to this later. And for those of you guys that are all jumping on live almost towards the tail end, don't forget this recording will be up in a couple of days. Titaniumagents.com, titaniumagents.com. Or you can go back and watch this live. But the, one of the other things that really works for me when I'm talking to independent brokerages, I say, listen, you have 30 agents now or 100, whatever it is. Those agents aren't running around recruiting for you. 
they don't want any more people taking the leads from this independent brokerage. And quite honestly, deep down inside, they might have a special relationship with you as the broker, but let's be honest, you don't have what all the big box companies have. You don't have the CRMs, you don't have the marketing, you don't have the training, the conventions, all the things that other people want. So they might love you and want to stay at your brokerage, but they're not running around recruiting. So when you give them the opportunity to have revenue share, they're going to go and recruit and build your organization, whether you like it or not, because they're still trying to build yours. And here's the really nice part. Once they start recruiting and have a couple people under them, they want their production to go up too, because they're, everybody's watching them. So they start getting into their own production more. It's amazing how you take an agent, like I can think of one right now out of Seattle. I just, this girl's really blown my mind lately. She started recruiting like four or five pretty good agents. And all of a sudden I'm watching her production and she's super confident and like, she's like a whole new person than 60, 90 days ago when I met her because she's, she's plugged in and she's, I'm just like, wow, okay. Where'd that come from? But I know what it is. She's got a taste of revenue share. She's got a taste of camaraderie and collaboration. And, and now her production's going up and I see her going to more classes. And I mean, it's just, it's a, it's an amazing what happens when, and, and Brent's really the one that taught me that Brent Gove. He said, yeah, I don't mind talking to my level nines and tens because that it motivates them upwards. But I didn't realize that it also motivates them upwards in production. That's a big thing. <laughs> right? That's a big thing. You're, you're, you're actually getting more of the revenue share that you deserve uh, by letting them go out and recruit for you. And the if pace of the leader sets the pace of the pack, right? She's now leading by example. Mm -hmm. She wants all her people to be productive. How can she expect them to do something that she's not willing to do herself? And she's, she's, and now she has the confidence, right? She's, she's viewing herself in those new shoes as a leader now. But the independent broker is usually exhausted and sick of recruiting. And they're just like, I don't even want to recruit anymore because I can't keep a good one. And I don't want to recruit a crappy one because they're just a waste of time. So when you say all these agents are going to run, run, run around and recruit for you, they're going to be like, hmm, that sounds pretty good. It really has, it really has worked. I can't wait in the next week or two, we're going to bring two really big independent brokerages over and I'm going to get those leaders on this call and touch bases back on these conversations and kind of like I was doing with Craig and say, does that sound familiar? Does that sound familiar? Is this the reason you came? And they're going to be like, yes, because I've had those conversations with them. So it's pretty fun. All right. It's, it's 102. So we're done. Is anybody, any last thoughts to throw in here? We get to do it again next week. So go ahead, Don. Thanks guys. No, I'm good. Thank you. Okay. Appreciate right. being able to be a part of it. And thank you guys for being live on Facebook. Thank you guys for being live here. It's always better to be jumping in than listening to the recordings. And we really appreciate you guys. If there's something we missed or something you want to talk about, uh, reach out to me privately and I'll make sure we cover it with you. And Noel, thank you for being our guest. Craig, thank you for jumping on. Kevin, as always. Jonathan, you're a trooper. Brian, you're awesome. And Nate from Austin, you're too quiet. Next week, you got to speak up. <laughs> okay, guys. Take care. Love you all. See you.